begin today, I'd like to pay um, acknowledgments to the traditional owners of the land where we're meeting, which is the Dergaric people, and pay my respect to elders past and present. And I'd like to welcome you to this um, wonderful event. Um, uh, Professor Jim Piper is going to share his stories and reflections of his time here at Macquarie University. And we also have our former university librarian, Maxine Brody, who is going to um, interview Jim and, um, and moderate the questions from the audience. And for those of you who haven't met me, I'm um, the new university librarian, <laughs> Joanne Sparks. And I'd like to welcome Jim's students and everyone who's come out today. I know um, there is a lot of love in the room here and a lot of interest in what might be revealed. <laughs> I had a little bit of uh, a preview, so you should be on the edge of your chairs. Okay, and I think now I can turn it over to Maxine. So thank you, Maxine and Jim. Thanks, Joanne, and thanks everybody for coming. It's great to uh, come back to Macquarie. Uh, to be able to do something like this for such a great member of the Macquarie community um, as Jim, and I'm sure you'll agree with that. It's also great to be in this wonderful new theatre to be able to, to do that, so I hope you enjoy the venue too, as, as I'm sure we will. I thought about, you know, when Joanne asked me to do this, why me? Um, you know, I've just escaped, just retired from, <laughs> from Macquarie. Uh, and I guess there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that I'm a lover of stories, and you can't keep me away from a good story, and I know Jim has lots of those and we need to hear them. Uh, the second reason um, is I met Jim probably well before I came to Macquarie, um, one way or another, so we've known each other for a very long time. And that's sort of the second reason. And the third reason is when you delve into somebody's background, there are always six degrees of separation. Everybody know about that, how you travel the world and you, you, know, you meet your next door neighbour, that kind of thing. Well, in looking at Jim's CV, which I have to say is a stellar piece of work, I discovered that he started his research career in earnest at Oxford, and we're going to start there in a minute. But what I hadn't realised is that he was at Walson College at about the same time as my sister. <laughs> now, my sister was in biochemistry, so they probably never met. And she told me to tell you she was in the, the ladies' rowing age at Walson as well, but you probably never uh, knew them either. So there's the six degrees of separation. Um, we actually have, <laughs> yeah, have a, a college in common back there. But Jim, we, this is all about you, so we want to start back there at Oxford. You had a BSc and a PhD from Otago. You then went off to, to Oxford uh, as a postdoc and then as a junior research fellow. And we're talking early 70s here? Yep. So yep. I want to take you back to the early 70s in Oxford and what that was like and where did you start thinking about coming to Macquarie? and what were the choices that you might have had back then? Okay, well, uh, thank you. And I, can I say it's a pleasure to um, see so many um, uh, friends and colleagues. Um, I finished my, I went to uh, Otago University, did my bachelor's degree uh, there and, and PhD, um, and finished uh, actually in the end of 1970, and I was, ripe old age of 23 at that time. Um, and uh, I had uh, followed the path of a number of uh, um, other students from Otago and those were the days where, you know, there was a fairly conventional path to, to you know, go, go to the old country or, or America. So I went, actually arrived in Oxford in 1971 and I was on a New Zealand um, University Grants uh, committee uh, fellowship and subsequently um, transferred to what was called a, um, a CVD um, position and I should mention that um, I, uh, I, people know I'm a laser person, right? And, but my PhD was in atomic physics and I went to Oxford because there was this new guy, Colin Webb, who um, was a, a, a Brit um, uh, had been at uh, Bell Labs and was in the ground floor of uh, discovery of lasers uh, in the United States and then had come back to uh, England and took up this position at Oxford. Uh, and he was very interested in um, 
uh, new types of uh, lasers and uh, how they worked. And when I went there, because I'd been working on collision physics, I was going to do uh, this uh, project on basic collision phenomena. But when I got there, there was an American postdoc um, from Yale University, and uh, he said he, he didn't want to do laser work, he wanted to work on the basic phenomena. So um, uh, my boss, Colin Webb, then said, will I start the laser work? So I started doing that. Uh, inevitably, in those days, and still the case, lasers uh, um, have many wide applications, but um, many in defence. And a lot of the early work was actually funded out of defence. Uh, so tell us about CVD. Okay, so CVD uh, is interesting, the, um, uh, the history of these things. The CVD at that, that stage stood for Committee um, for Valve Development. And you might say, what did this have to do with anything? Um, and and um, during the war, or well, before the war, a lot of um, uh, uh, German Jewish scientists uh, had escaped from Germany before the war, uh, and uh, many of them were really expert in, in um, plasmas and atomic physics and so on. And so during the war, the, um, uh, they were, uh, these scientists were not allowed to be employed in British defence establishments. But they did have a lot to offer. So the Committee for Valve Development was set up to fund these scientists, most working at Oxford, to develop magnetrons and klystrons, which those of you in the know mean radar. So they were actually hired to do work on radar development. And I always get uh, confused, and my colleague Dennis Hall will probably um, correct me, but they actually developed the magnetron, I think, which was the fundamental thing inside uh, radar. And this thing was still going on um, 25 years later. So I was hired by the Committee for Valve Development mm -hmm. to develop lasers uh, which, which had uh, defence um, applications um, uh, and we were funded by the Ministry of Supply. And one of my first visits was to defence labs in, in Baldock, which is up the A1 north of London. In fact, there I met Dennis Hall, who was uh, working on CO2 lasers at the time. Uh, and indeed, many of the contacts I made in Oxford uh, then are people who were, became quite prominent in, in Britain. Okay. So there you are, a junior research fellow, Clarendon Labs, Oxford. Yep. What happened then? Well, um, I um, uh, used to see this quite attractive girl work, walking down the road from um, the biochemistry department. That's uh, your sister. <laughs> Not my sister, I have to do it. Uh, my, my, no, and um, I had a flatmate, actually, a British uh, girl, who um, was doing a uh, MPhil in sociology, and she was at, at, at Wilson, and she um, decided to uh, try and set me up with various colonial girls at, um, at Wilson College, because she was there. And uh, a bit of a sore point with my wife, because um, uh, she was her second attempt, not the first. And... Um, <laughs> The first attempt, which was ill-fated, was a girl from Tasmania who only um, lasted a few months at Oxford and then left. I don't know that I had anything to do with that. But, <laughs> but then, then uh, Lisa uh, uh, introduced me to Anita, who was actually um, uh, a Monash PhD student in biochemistry. Um, uh, and she was at Wilson, and it was really through her edging that I got a junior research fellowship. And um, at that time, Wilson were building what was, by Oxford standards, a really palatial new building on the, on the Charwell. Uh, and it was like moving into, you know, the Ritz compared with most student digs. But um, uh, she was finishing her PhD. I'd done, um, you know, several years of postdoc. Uh, we were sort of looking to go uh, what we're going to do after that. Um, uh, we, in fact, almost certainly, I was offered jobs in, in, um, in the US at the top lab. So Bell Labs was the top lab in, in um, New Jersey at Homdell. It had several Nobel Prize winners. I was offered a job there. And also at Hughes uh, Research Labs, that's Hughes Aircraft, who had a fantastic lab at Malibu. And that was also really attractive. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and work, working with, um, 
with uh, people at Caltech. Um, and I, we're off those jobs, and she lined up a postdoc at University of Maryland, but in the meantime, we thought, oh, well, if some jobs come out of Australia, um, uh, I'll apply. And in fact, I applied for a job at um, Macquarie University, um, never having heard of it. Uh, this was in um, 19, um, 1974, I guess. Um, in fact, my staff number is 74. Um, and um, uh, I asked some people um, what they knew about Macquarie University, and in fact, the guy whose office was next door to me said, oh, that's where John Ward is. And so many people in this room, uh, apart from the physicists, would, know that the, would not know that the only Macquarie University staff member while here who was nominated for the Nobel Prize was John Ward, FRS. And he was a very famous uh, theorist. Um, quite uh, idiosyncratic for those that uh, knew him. In fact, he was convinced there should be only six people doing theoretical physics in the world, and one of them was him. Uh, <laughs> and he was, in fact, nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1983 and was actually awarded to the work he was doing. Unfortunately, it went to his supervisor. He was Abdus Salam. But at that time, you know, we, that would have been uh, quite a remarkable thing for such an unheard of university to have a Nobel Prize winner. But um, I just followed through. I applied for the job. Um, and as a lecturer? Uh, as a lecturer, yeah. Um, in fact, we didn't have A's, B's and C's and so on then. It was, there were senior tutors that later became lecturer A's. And I applied for this lectureship and didn't hear anything at all. And um, no, no response. <laughs> That's right. Nothing's changed. Um, and uh, one morning I was saying to an oh, um, we were living at Wilson at the time, look, the people from the US are pressing us. I've really got to make a decision. If I don't hear uh, anything, um, I'm really going to have to reply to them. And I biked down to the lab. It was a Saturday morning. And here in my in box was a telegram, you know, like with those little strips of paper on it that old folks remember, um, and offering me this job. Uh, and um, I remember it quite well. The, the salary was $11,000. Uh, I accepted the job. Uh, uh, just before I left, I went to thank the... Um, the head of the Clarendon Labs, who was Brebus Blini, and the physicists will know the very famous book called Blini and Blini, which was on electromagnetism, because his wife was a physicist as well. And, and I went to just um, thank him for giving me a reference, because obviously he gave me a reasonable reference. Uh, and we went to this beautiful uh, office that Lord Charwell, you know, who was Churchill's advisor, had, and was all wood paneling and whatever, and I thank Brebus, and he, he said, come in, you know, have a sherry. And so I sat down and had a sherry and, and these big winged chairs, you know, and we chatted desultorily away. I thanked him and he said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Not at all. What are they paying you? And in fact, the day before I'd had a, had a letter, and this was because 74 and Whitlam had just got in, and there was a massive increase in academic salaries by about 30%. So my salary had gone from $11,000 to almost sixteen, dollars And in that time, the, uh, the exchange rate was about, I think, $1.8 to the pound. So I told him what I was being paid, and he looked a bit ashen, and it turned out to be twice what he was being paid. <laughs> um, but but I, he still let me finish the sherry. Um, <laughs> so then we came. Mm -hmm. So we, tell us about your first week at Macquarie. Uh, right, OK. Well, when I... <laughs> Uh, it was a bit touch and go. Um, my, uh, Anita was finishing her PhD and she had to spend an extra couple of months doing experiments and so she didn't come with me directly. So I arrived here in um, May 75 by way of Washington where I went to a um, conference in the Washington Hilton there which was notorious because only about a month later there was a shooting outside the Washington Hilton. Um, uh, and I arrived here, and, and the first person I met was John Ward, actually. And he was a very idiosyncratic guy. He had, he had um, glasses with, you know, incredibly thick 
lenses uh, and, and very unusual. He once told me that he um, didn't speak till he was seven. And the first thing he said was E equals MC squared or something like that. <laughs> um, but he was a very, very uh, smart guy. But he, he had come here because he was extremely disillusioned with the scene. Uh, internationally, he was sort of really a bit of a recluse. And his first words of advice were to me, don't expect to do research here. Um, uh, you know, just do your teaching and, and collect your paycheck every week and have a good time. And I, you know, uh, as a fresh young postdoc, in fact, I had designed a kit set experiment, which came in a sort of a coffin-like thing about a few weeks later, had it all made so I could do, do stuff straight away. And, uh, but his, his, it was a very negative view. Uh, at that time, Macquarie, of course, was very young. Um, best research was in biological sciences, and that's continued to be very strong. Um, but it was sort of quite depressing, really. And um, there were half as many buildings. Um, I can remember the trees in the courtyard were this high. And sort of looking out uh, from um, uh, E7B down towards where the vice chancellor's office is now, it was absolutely nothing. It was clay everywhere. Uh, so it was, um, you know, not, not that um, pretty. Um, I must say that my greatest fear that we'd have a terrible library, and in fact we didn't, we had a wonderful library. And we've always had the best libraries. So um, that, that, was, that was a great uh, relief. But after the first week, I thought I'd made a terrible mistake. And... Um, Anita was still in Oxford and I called her up and I said, look, this is just awful, I think. It's because I hadn't exactly said no to Bell Labs. And uh, I thought, oh, um, maybe, maybe I should c come back. Um, and there was a bit of a sub-story about that because when I had a letter from the registrar, they said, um, we'll pay your fare and your wife. And um, uh, we weren't exactly married at the time. And, uh, and so we went into this long thing about the definition of a wife. I wrote to the registrar. <laughs> and we, we didn't get any reply, of course. Um, and in fact, we even went so far as to go down to the registrar's office in the broad in, um, in Oxford and ask the registrar about, could we sort of just get married there? And they get married again in, in, in Australia. And he was actually very shocked at the suggestion and said, no, you'd be a bigamist. Uh, and I said, to the same woman? And I said, anyway, it was just, I never got a reply. So the idea was that she was going to come later. She had a CSRO grant and that was all. Because she actually uh, was going to have to go back to Oxford she was going to submit her thesis and have to go back to Oxford to have, a, uh, have their, her viva. Uh, and we then put in this big story to the provost in Oxford that um, could we not arrange a viva in Australia? And because there was a provision to do that which had been set up during the war, so American students didn't have to come back to, to Oxford. So we wrote to the provost with our, with our reasons. And they came back saying, oh, no, 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 this is not designed for people who just are making a lifestyle choice, basically. Um, uh, very stuffy. And uh, Anita's um, supervisor, who was not an Oxford type, um, was very annoyed about, about this and accounted it by choosing three Australian examiners. And so Oxford was going to have to pay for them all to go to... <laughs> And so Oxford, with principle and money, there's no doubt which wins. And so she actually subsequently came here, had her thing here. So we, we, she was still there just finishing. Um, after the first week, I was pretty depressed, and I had a friend across at Sydney University who said, um, oh, there's a seminar at, at Sydney University. Why don't you, you know, relieve yourself of the intellectual vac vacuum at, at Macquarie and come out there? Uh, and I kid you not, that um, was so appalling at Sydney. Um, they had these famous old professors, Watson Munro and Harry Messel, who you'll, most of you know about. And it was sort of the worst of sort of old-fashioned 
entitlement. I remember going to the seminar and these professors came. I was, you know, really junior, of course. Uh, these old professors came in and sort of came in late and shuffled around and talked during the, the thing. And it was just, you know, the whole atmosphere was deadly. And I thought, my God, things could be worse. I could be at Sydney University. <laughs> so, so I caught up Anita and, and I thought, um, so the great thing about Macquarie, well, you know, I, I, it's a little um, sort of figurative. It's a greenfield site, actually. It was clay, but it was, you know, greenfield site. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and if I, you know, there are not all these barbed wire and ditches surrounding everything, you know, you can do what you, I could do what I wanted. And um, so, uh, you know, I determined, well, I'd be at Macquarie, it would, I could do stuff that I wanted. Uh, I felt it, you know, that it would reward me. And I have to say that that was my experience. Uh, and certainly, when we talk about this later, something that's really guided me as a DVC, um, uh, that experience that M Macquarie's a good place at, at um, rewarding performance and rewarding effort, I've always found. So that was, that for me, I, I could start off, I would do that, and then, then I got recognised for performing well, and, and M Macquarie had always treated me well like that, and one of the things that I always wanted to do was uh, as a DVC was to make sure that any person that came here, you know, a lowly level A or junior postdoc as I was, could effectively have a path to becoming one of our stars. Uh, so that's, that's why I uh, decided to stay and it worked out for me. So let's talk about your career as a researcher first and we will come back to the DVC role. Uh, if you look at GenCV, you'd go a long way to find a better one in terms of the publications, the patents, the awards, the contribution you've made professionally. But it's interesting to learn, as with a lot of people, that you sort of got into lasers almost by accident rather than by design. So yes. having got into it by accident, what was the passion? Well, um, the, the first lasers were primarily gas devices and they had a lot of incredible interesting physics about the, how they work. I mean, I'm not going to give you a lecture about lasers, but um, uh, you have to arrange for electrons to bang into atoms and molecules and excite them in a certain way. So it actually had a lot of really interesting physics in it. And the, one of the great things about gases is you can vary them almost infinitely. You, know, you can mix them all up, put all sorts of stuff in them uh, quite easily, which is a lot harder with sort of solid state materials, which are very difficult to grow. Um, but it was very interesting, it had very good basic physics, but also very topical, and, and I, I guess it'd be fair to say that I was, became known as the first sort of laser professor in Australia. Um, and indeed, I mean, uh, one thing I should mention, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was treated well, I was promoted to, I came here in 75, I started um, in uh, 83, I was promoted to, um, associate professor. I remember it quite well. At that time, um, there was an evaluation of physics department. It was actually done by, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now, but you know, basically a bit like ERA in a way, publications, citations, um, grants, that sort of thing. And Macquarie Physics came out at 17th equal. There were 18 universities at the time. <laughs> Interestingly, also on 17th equal was the ANU, but not the, um, you know, the general study side of ANU. And I remember, I think Peter Brown, who's here, came in 83 maybe, Peter, something like that. Um, and uh, so we were ranked effectively last. And uh, uh, I subsequently, uh, there was, uh, in fact, John Wood retired. And, and a chair was advertised, and I applied for that and got it and started in 84. Uh, and I think at that time I swore that the physics department was not going to be the last physics department uh, in the country. And so I guess to get that off my chest, one of the things of great pride to me is the physics department is now amongst the top four in the country. Uh, and um, it's been great to contribute to that. One of the foundations of that, so in, in uh, 80, um, 
2003, I think it was. Well, at the end of the um, Fraser government, they decided to have centres of excellence. And I think there might have been an early round of centre of excellence, maybe in, in 70, 81 or something like that. Uh, but then there was a change of government. The Labour government came in and they decided to do it again. And they had a round of centres of excellence in 1987. Uh, and I still have the application for that. For those who have just finished ARC, I'm sorry, but I got 15 million um, by writing three pages. <laughs> and I still have the application. In fact, two pa only two pages of that were about the science. It was literally that short. Uh, and um, so I applied for that, um, and Brian Orr had come across from uh, University of New South Wales to join us, and uh, Peter had joined us, and so on. So we ab applied for that, and um, uh, there were uh, 150 applications, and three were awarded, and we were one of those. Uh, and this was um, uh, pretty remarkable for, uh, for Macquarie uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, that, that centre was funded through to its maximum in 1996. Um, and uh, like a lot of those things, they are sort of transformational because you get you know, lots of graduate students and you attract lots of staff and postdocs. And I think that centre um, was um, quite um, pivotal because now it's sort of evolved and evolved and physics department has parts of two major centres and, and uh, currently bidding for a, you know, another one and all that sort of thing. So those things have quite large um, consequences. In fact, at the end of that in 1996, we had bid for a conference called the International Quantum, Electron conference, Quantum Electronics Conference, which is the biggest conference in the world for people in basic laser science. And we were awarded that. And it's the first and only time that's been in the Southern Hemisphere. And that, things like that, I, you know, I encourage people to, to do that. Things like that where we had uh, you know, 800 of the world's top scientists come to Australia. It was in Sydney. It was actually in the, exhibition, in the, um, in the um, conference centre, which was new at the time, um, uh, are quite transformational because they create, you know, a lot of people get to know what's happening in Australia. It's very um, inspirational to graduate students and young staff and so on. And that was in 1996, and so that was all part of that centre and, and um, carried it on. So, but I mean, I, you know, we did um, uh, also incur a number of enemies in the process, of course. Uh, you know, I remember. Uh, one of my uh, very old friends from New Zealand, who's very famous, uh, Professor Dan Walls, is the father of modern quantum optics, uh, one of the great stars um, of, uh, of optical science. Uh, when that was announced, he, he was known to, to, heard to say that how could they give the best centre in physics, and the only centre in physics, to the worst physics department in, in the country. Uh, and so I did have to put up with a bit of that, um, but, uh, but I think, um, you know, basically it was because that sort of um, science was really fresh, really new, very exciting, was very internationally connected, um, and I know they interviewed people, you know, they had referees from Stanford and MIT and those sorts of things, uh, and so one built that, and when you have a group of 50 people, which that probably had at its apogee, you can do a lot, and then it starts to spin off lots of other things uh, in the nature of things. So even although that finished in 96, it sort of had a, had a life, and um, many of the students who uh, were um, postgraduate students at the time are now with the department. Uh, Mick Whitford is a professor, actually, in the physics department, there's about six or seven people who, who were you know, students or postdocs from that area, era, and they, they actually uh, then move on and have great contributions themselves. So talk to us about what you think some of the major achievements of that research have been. What are the, I mean, you, you talked about being, that John Ward was a, a theoretician and you're an experimentalist. So yeah. What are, what are the things, I know you're going to a sort of well, seminar and yeah. impact after this, so. What's been the things that have had the biggest impact on your research? Yeah. So um, John, John, uh, he had um, he had 
two sides, and one of which was a great benefit to me, because although he despised all other theorists, he had this almost unnatural admiration for experimentalists, because they actually do something, you know. Um, I, I, I don't know whether John Corbett's here, but I remember um, uh, John Corbett, who's well known to many people from the maths department, works in mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, and I think it was probably about 79 when John came and and I was in the tea room and um, chatting with John and finding out what he was doing. And John Wood came and I sat down and I said, do you know John Corbett? Huh? You know? and, um, and he said, what do you do? And, and John said, I work in, in uh, mathematics foundations of quantum, quantum mechanics. And John Wood said, who appointed you? Obviously, I wasn't on the selection committee. <laughs> <laughs> so... But, but for me, it was good because he had this almost unnatural admiration for people who could, you know, make stuff work. And so I got on very, very well with him. Uh, and uh, he was sort of very supportive in that uh, early, early time. But um, we had started working in an um, area of high-power visible lasers called copper vapor lasers. They were very important. Uh, because uh, copper lasers at the time, now replaced, but were the only high-power lasers that could, uh, could provide the foundation for laser isotope separation, separation of uranium and plutonium. And, uh, of course, that was very important, you know, not only for the nuclear industry, but the nuclear bomb industry as well. Uh, and uh, at the peak of those, there were major groups in... 25 countries, you know, the Russians, the French, the British, of course, the Germans, everybody else, working on these very high power lasers to do isotope separation. And um, they were an interesting device because uh, for those applications, people wanted very high power. And these things, um, uh, you could make them fatter. They were actually ran with a whole lot of pulses, sequence of pulses. And the average power was the pulse per, the energy per pulse times the pulse energy. Problem was you can make them really big and get large pulse energy, but when you did that, you couldn't operate them so fast. So they, their total power just sort of topped out and that was a problem. Uh, and um, we worked for a long time on understanding that problem. And uh, uh, it was a very complex um, uh, thing. But after actually working for uh, 20 years in those, and every time writing ARC grants saying, if only we could understand this process, we'd be able to change this. Uh, we finally cracked that and um, uh, in quite a radical way. But in some senses, a little too late because by that stage, um, the Americans had pretty much well decided to stop laser isotope separation in favour of other things. Three Mile Island had happened. Um, and so we actually cracked that problem. So a device that previously gave about 40 watts of average power could now give 400 watts. That was a problem because under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, any device more than 40 watts was not, you couldn't sell it. You couldn't um, uh, sell it. And, our technology, which in the end required sort of 20 years of understanding exactly what was happened, but in the end was a $10 solution. We actually, you just had to put a trace, uh, a trace additional gas in to completely change how all, the, all these dynamics worked. Um, and so it was a $10 solution, but ultimately in the early 2000s when we published this and we did a major publication we submitted to... Um, a leading um, American journal, and we got a letter back from the editor saying, um, this is fantastic, but unless, unless you get clearance from the Australian and British governments, we won't publish it. Uh, and, you know, because at that time, people started being worried about this technology propagating around. Uh, and so we knew the writing was on the wall, so we had to stop that work. Um, so that was sort of one of our um, uh, big things. And there was one time when you'd go across uh, to the labs there and there all these incredible high power. And they were amazing lasers because they're um, green and yellow, the national colours. 
Um, and they're incredibly high power, big fat beavers, they're quite spectacular. But we then started working on uh, other ways of approaching that and with Helen Pask who was a PhD student uh, with us and then went to Britain and came back, initiated new types of approaches to that which have now taken that, uh, that over. But um, in, in my career I've always loved the visible because with lasers there's nothing worse than one you can't see because uh, they are quite uh, uh, dramatic. So with us it's been about develop, understanding how devices work um, and it's often incredibly complex and working out how to do that and then maximising the outcome and so on. So there was a time when the lab was full of these huge high power lasers. Now it's full of much smaller lasers which give almost the same power, uh, which are widely used now in, in uh, medical applications and so on. And more recently got increasing. When I was in um, Oxford, uh, my wife worked in the biochemistry lab and um, one of the postdocs who was a junior fellow at Wilson was a guy called Keith Williams. Uh, and Keith Williams was subsequently appointed as uh, a professor here at Macquarie. And we'd known each other for a long time. And Keith, people will know about Keith. He was one of the prime movers in the invention of proteomics. So our proteomics were all sort of uh, stimulated by Keith Williams. Later left and set up proteome systems and um, and made some money and has been in the commercial area for a long time. But because I was really interested in that, I started looking at um, laser applications in, in diagnostics, uh, in biomedical diagnostics. And uh, hopefully this will resonate with people you might remember. 1995, the great cryptosporidium scare, for those who were, you know, not in, prim in, prim in primary school at the time, those oldest ones. So the great cryptosporidium scare. You remember when Sydney had to boil its water and all this sort of stuff? What is maybe not so widely known as that scare was generated by Macquarie University. <laughs> what actually happened is we'd been working with, um, and this is Duncan Veal actually, is a mi microbiology group in, 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 in biological sciences, had been working on a test for cryptosporidium. And cryptosporidium is really hard to do a test for. You know, up until recently, and it's still the case, many microbiological tests are like a century old. You know, you get a sample, you grow it, you put it on a microscope and sort of count it and look at it and so on. Um, and cryptosporidium is really hard to do because uh, it, it doesn't grow very well uh, and the particles are very small. Uh, and we've been working um, this group with biologists and us on developing a test for cryptosporidium with uh, Australian Water Technologies, which is part of the Water Board. Uh, in fact, we're make, making good progress on that and it involved quite a complex thing of using immunomagnetic separation and then, then fly cytometry using fluorescence. And we finally cracked the problem. Uh, and um, quite an interesting story because it's one of those things where people, you get a technological s a solution but no one's thought about the consequences of that in a business sense. And so what happened was we developed this test, we started testing water. And uh, that was interesting because the, um, the Liberal government of Grimet, we reported that to the government and they just were not interested, they didn't take any notice. Um, and then there was a change of government and it became the Labor government and the thing that really made them, we were sort of measuring water samples from Western Sydney and they didn't care too much. But we then tested water in Macquarie Street uh, <laughs> and we found there was a thousand times more cryptosporidium than there was supposed to be. Uh, and so they suddenly took a lot of notice. Um, and um, there were truckloads of water samples. So during that crisis, you see, it suddenly became known there were levels of the cryptosporidium a thousand times more than people thought were safe. Actually, it turned out that no one really knew what was safe. And in the end, there wasn't a big outbreak of cryptosporidiasis. And there was, uh, except, except that the E.G. Whitlam pool, but that was to do with kids pooing in the pool. We <laughs> won't go there. Um, uh, so, um, but, but it was a wonderful example because, uh, you know, Waterboard had been paying us to develop this test. We developed it, it showed the stuff, and no one had thought about how to handle that. And if you recall at the time, one of the results is both the 
chairman of the water board, who was um, Hill, you know, the chairman of the ABC, uh, David Hill, and the CEO both lost their jobs because of this huge sort of scandal about, oh, um, Sydney's polluted water. Uh, and it was not till some sensible guy from the health department got up and said, well, we don't really know there's a problem, we're not seeing outbreaks of cryptosporidiosis. But that test actually is the world standard test now. So it's one thing you can be proud of. I often say to students, you know, look at that glass of water, how do you know it's, it's not going to make you sick because of a Macquarie University test that is worldwide on, on making sure that the levels of cryptosporidium Give you an idea how hard that is. Um, this is not a litre of water, but there'd be actually 10 to the 23 particles in this. Actually, one spore of cryptosporidium in here can make you sick. And in fact, at the time, about half the deaths for people with AIDS were attributed to waterborne um, stuff. So it's actually an important breakthrough. And there's an interesting corollary of that because. Um, uh, Duncan Veal's group actually um, did quite a lot of subsequent work on why it happened. And probably you can't remember the 1997, but it was a, we'd had a fabulous Indian summer. And then just in time for Easter, it started to rain. And it rained for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the um, Warragamba Dam was very low. And um, it, it sort of pissed with rain and the whole thing filled up. But during droughts, the, of course, the, the catchment area is restricted uh, and it was a lot of old farmland and there are a hell of a lot of kangaroos up there and the and kangaroos are hosts for Cryptosporidium parvin, which is the nasty variant. And so when, in the drought, they all came down around the dam and the water went down and down and they would then... So there was a ring of about a foot, full of, a foot uh, high of kangaroo poo around the, around the dam. Uh, and then it started to rain. And of course, the water went up, and all the kangaroo poo went into the, into the dam. And that's where all the cryptosporidium came from. And so it was actually to do with very interesting ecological problems. Uh, uh, that, um, so um, that was one of the things that, that we sort of research advances. I told you about high power lasers. Um, uh, our recent work on, um, uh, on uh, uh, high power solid state lasers where we can now get blue and green and uh, multicolour lasers but uh, uh, the um, yellow lasers which we worked on and commercialised now being used for ophthalmology turns out yellow light is much better than the current uh, you know green or yellow because uh, the reason the eye is so sensitive to yellow is that it's strongly absorbed by chromophores in the eye and particularly blood blood absorbs yellow light and so it's much more effective in a lot of those applications involving blood vessels in the eye. And that's been commercialised and uh, people are out selling uh, that. And then more recently I got increasingly interested in these biomedical applications. That whole thing of um, trying to find, you know, if not cryptosporidium here, what about, you know, Legionella or Staphylococcus in one of... Uh, and so uh, this sort of so-called... Um, Rare pathogen detection, very important. Staphylococcus, you know, hospital-borne infection. Turns out that you could get infection transmitted between patients in a theatre by the fact that the theatre nurses were typing on a keyboard with their gloves on, but they're typing on a keyboard, and just one or two Staphylococcus golden staph, uh, Staphylococcus A, on that keyboard could be picked up and then transmitted to the next patient. And so things like trying to find ways of, of detecting incredibly low amounts of these um, uh, pathogens tend to be a really important problem, and an incredibly difficult one, and a very fun one. And, and we have a, a very strong group led by Dr. Jin Jian and a whole group of students sitting there who have been incredibly effective in developing all the technologies associated with, with that. Um, uh, indeed, we've recently been funded by a um, small um, foundation called the Page Weatherspoon Foundation, which is one of these things that happen. It's a very, this is a very small town in South Australia. Um, the local um, guys, I think, a panel beater, 
their daughter got, uh, you know, meningococcal disease um, is, is a very nasty disease because it, it, it attacks the young. And uh, his daughter died at age nine. And they raised money in this little town to try and do something about testing for, uh, for, for meningococcus disease. And where they gave us some initial tranche of funding. They've been working on demonstrating that. And we've now got additional funding. And wouldn't that be fantastic if we can do that? Um, meningococcal um, bacteria, the doubling time is 20 minutes. Currently, the, the fastest test you can do is eight hours. That means the organism has grown by a factor of 1,000 in that time. So what happens at the moment if they suspect you might have that, you get a huge battery of antibiotics, they try and knock it off. But it's very, and that has a lot of side effects. So wouldn't it be wonderful to um, take a swab and within an hour find out what, what, what is infecting this uh, child? So that to me, was, and, and I mention that particular, that foundation, because it's sort of typical of what you get when you move into that area, you, you get people who are incredibly passionate about finding a solution and they actually raise money by barbecues and that sort of thing in this tiny little town on the highway in, in South Australia. So the, the passion that you're exhibiting there, you can see the passion that Jim has for his research. I've got to ask the question on behalf of most of you, which is, so why the heck did you end up with DVC research, Jim? <laughs> and has it cramped your style as a researcher? Um, yeah, well, I've been, I, I have to say I've been very lucky in, in making that transition that that because I've a lot of students that are still here and I like always like working with students I've been able to sort of carry that on at the side I mean they do that I mean they wouldn't let me near anywhere near their experimental rigs anymore I can guarantee that but I certainly always found I had uh, the opportunity to um, talk about the concepts and, and guide it but um, well, so what I, why did I do that? Um, you know, in research, you start off, um, you're, you're just your own researcher, right? And, and then your first big day is when you get a graduate student, right? And then your next big day is when you get a postdoc. Actually, that's a huge breakthrough when you get your first postdoc because you're starting to have uh, more capacity. Um, and uh, so you can, you know, because you've got more, more um, capacity, you can address wider problems and more of them. And, um, and I, I found uh, in, in my career, I wanted to do that. So I wanted to address big problems. And if there's a bit of advice I could give to the multitude, um, one of the things about um, academics and research is they, they always want to control their own agenda, right? And uh, too many academics have become self-limiting because you get to a point where you're at your maximum capacity at controlling your agenda. And there's a point at which you need to move on from that. So you either say, well, that's OK, and I'm going to limit myself at that because I want to control everything. And, um, and if I move beyond that, I can't. But for me, it was about moving to, con uh, to address wider and bigger and more diverse agendas and of course what you've got to do there is sort of um, uh, uh, the only way you can do that is to to have more people and empower them and trust them to do stuff and and, um, and work at a higher level and so I'd done that you know as a grew my uh, group um, got this big center at one stage you know there's 50 people in that center a lot of postdocs and colleagues and uh, graduate students, and that was great to be able to address a progressively wider agenda. And although we sort of started off with this fairly narrow base, it expanded enormously over the period. And so when um, I got to that point, and the previous vice chancellor had asked me to do that when um, Peter Berquist had, had retired, uh, and I originally said, oh, not quite ready for that yet, but then finally decided to do it. And the main reason is because, you know, you go to that point and um, uh, I wouldn't do any other job in the executive, I can assure you, but the research one is great because it's, again, it's almost that ultimate of controlling or assisting and empowering even on a greater, wider scale. Uh, so, so, you know, you've got your own little group. It's like you start off with your own sort of you know, gypsy moth, and then you're flying a Spitfire, and then a, a bigger plane, and then a 
you know, jumbo jet. And the, the bigger that gets, the less sort of um, uh, direct control you have. But you have all these other folks that are doing that, and you control on piloting the whole thing until you graduate, well, not to the Titanic, but you know what I mean, <laughs> uh, a much bigger plane. And, um, and so the reason I decided to do that was that I just felt um, uh, there was a bigger agenda, which was about the university. So it was a group I was dean for a while, as you mentioned at the start. Uh, and then I felt, um, I think, uh, a lot of those things that I learned um, could be applied just sort of on, a, on a grander scale and be used to um, not only just do laser physics or, or physics or science, but try and empower people to, um, to pursue their research, to identify talent and support it and nurture it and, and, and um, work on a grander scale. And, and I think, um, I guess one of the things that um, not only did we now have one of the best physics departments, but we have one of the best universities in Australia in research now. And, and I think, um, uh, look, analytically, and I'm a sort of scientist, but analytically, it's sort of not rocket science, really. It's about it's about support and resources and supporting the right people and continuing to reward, reward performance. And when I was um, mentioned my own experience, it really did um, influence me in that way. That that I'd come in at the most junior level. Uh, I'd been sort of empowered, allowed to do stuff, and was rewarded for doing it. And so a lot of the, the strategies that I put in place are really about that. It's about um, uh, every member of staff that arrives, whether a junior postdoc or a junior lecturer, ought to be able to sort of, in a sense, see the stairway of, to, heaven, to heaven in that respect. Um, it is true that under that system, um, rewarding performance, the great amount of the resources go to those who are performing, you know, so your super groups and stuff. Um, but, but also the ability to support you know, individuals who want to grow and who want to do stuff and get together and collaborate and go follow that same track, they should be empowered to do that. And, and uh, that's the sort of structure that we, uh, I think, use, which has been important in getting from that point. I mean, in 10 years, we've doubled the number of graduate students now. That would have been impossible without the incredible um, support of, of succeeding vice chancellors. We have pretty much the biggest scholarship budget in the country. And, and you know, uh, there are many times when I thought the VC would blink as, as we went from a million dollars of scholarship to five minute million, to 10, to 20, to 30 million dollars of, of funding. But, but, you know, you see that now in the fact that the number of graduate students is um, pressing on 2,000, they are the engine room of, of research in general. Um, but a, a part of that also is sort of rewarding the faculty as they go on. So. so what do you want to be remembered for as the DBSA research? Ah, um, um, <laughs> so yeah, the, there, are, there are things that I'm quite um, proud of. Uh, in physics, I want to be remembered um, as uh, you know, someone that I guess put that department on on um, to where it's where it's uh, it's got. One of the things I'm very proud of that that um, people sort of don't know so much that in the early 90s things were getting pretty tough for science. Uh, we wanted to uh, introduce engineering, but the government still controlled degrees, and so with a, a group of like-minded people, I set about setting up the Bachelor of Technology degrees. And um, uh, I think to a large extent, they actually did keep large parts of science afloat. And of course, that's now morphed into engineering and so on. That's going gangbusters. So that's one thing I felt that in terms of the teaching side of things and curriculum uh, was um, something that was uh, uh, very successful. Um, uh, then also, I guess that overall indicators of um, where Macquarie was sitting at the turn of the century, 
Um, our performance is actually going down. Um, and when I started at the end of 2002, we were actually, it was great because there's nothing better um, than, than comparing yourself with, the, with <laughs> as bad as it's ever been, you know. Um, but, you know, things had really dropped off um, and there were all sorts of reasons for that. There was big restructuring and changes of staff and stuff like that. It was a tough period. Um, but to go from there to the fact where we're now, what, number four in Leiden rankings on citation and stuff, that's, that's uh, great. Um, no secret that I have always loved graduate students. Um, I think um, uh, universities are about as close as you get to the fountain of youth in many respects, I think, because, you know, you, you have these students, and it's true of undergraduates, because, you know, we all have that experience of seeing undergraduates that start and then progress right through and do well. I think with the PhD students, it's very much uh, uh, that too. Um, you know, you start with these uh, folks who, who are sort of passionate about the sort of things they want to do, but they really don't know how to start and stuff, and then you develop that, that uh, through, and they do well, and you take a lot of... Um, satisfaction from us, but then they go, and then there's always some more. Uh, and so I've had about 40 PhD students. Um, I think uh, I've had a lot of international students, a group of students down here from, from China. Everybody knows I'm a sort of passionate um, engagement with China. One of the f just really rewarding things about China is, is that incredible um, passion for learning the fact that education is life-changing for people, for them, their families, and, um, and everything. And I think one of my great joys has been students uh, from China who have often come from not, you know, quite difficult backgrounds uh, in, in, any, in any, by any measure, and yet have, uh, A, work incredibly hard, B, are incredibly creative, C, work together incredibly well. So uh, I think graduate students, uh, I, uh, and I think we have an absolutely first-class graduate program at Macquarie, uh, and building that's been a great joy. I think the expansion of international, and then ultimately, of course, the thing that um, uh, I really um, wanted to achieve was the Master of Research, so sort of... Um, dynamiting um, Macquarie first and possibly the rest of the Australian system out of this very old-fashioned oddness thing that we've had and, and moving towards and I enjoyed the just incredible support within the university to, to do that so we have our new master's degree and there's a lot of people around the room who have uh, contributed to that both in the stages but also in offering it which is for the first year and I think actually that is going to transform graduate training in Australia. I mean, I, I, Nick Mansfield, who's the dean, he's done an incredible job uh, in implementing that, um, is in great demand. Um, uh, many universities are chasing him for, for the model. Uh, already several have, have um, determined, actually made the decision to move across. I, I think within probably three or four years, every major university in Australia will be actually following the Macquarie model. And, uh, and why do we do that? I mean, um, uh, it wasn't, uh, there were many or any reasons for doing it. Um, but at the heart of it is that truly believing that um, this is a better training for students, that we were actually not properly serving our students. Uh, they weren't competitive with the major international universities in terms of the depth of their coursework. And their and the approach to to research, the very sort of apprenticeship model for PhDs really needed to be replaced by a much more structured model in the early years. So many students waste their first year in fiddling around and one on one supervision and that sort of thing, which is inefficient. So I was really driven by um, I think a deep concern by myself, but also everybody who helped me, the associate dean's high degree research in saying there's got to be a better way for preparing students to do this. Um, uh, I mean, yes, it's giving us a market edge, which is great. Uh, the response to that internationally has been incredible. Um, 
uh, in terms of the fact that, you know, uh, the truth is um, uh, no one understands or recognises honours degrees outside Australia. And, and so the international market is, they, they understand master's degree. They know what they mean. They know what, what it's part of. And so we've been absolutely sort of flooded with interest from, um, from international countries, people wanting to come and, and so on. So I, I think in the end that's going to be a significant achievement for Macquarie. Um, um, good that it's known as the Macquarie model, because uh, that's the way the GO8 talk about it. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that probably will be a thing, I mean, the jury's out yet, of course, but probably will, will be a thing that transforms graduate training in Australia to bring it in line with the world and, and our university will be better off for that and our students in particular will be better off for that and of course they'll be very grateful <laughs> in due course. Okay, so I have to ask you the other side of the question and that is about the ones that got away. What are the regrets of things? I mean, I know you've, you've said, you know, there are times that you actually said, there were times when I, I said to myself, Christ, I wish I hadn't said that. Ah, uh, yes. But are there I have said, I have, I've suppressed as many of those as possible. Um, but what are the things that you think? Mm, yeah, gee. well, there are, of course, uh, you know, some missed opportunities. I must say, one of the things um, that's kept me at Macquarie, um, you know, I've had offers to go other places and so on, um, is the, the real desire to see... Macquarie, had, especially as it grew organically um, through the 90s and so on, Macquarie had this terrible habit of sort of snatching defeat from the jaws of triumph. And sort of, you know what I mean, and the incoming VC says, you know, Macquarie has is got just so much going for him and these, these great stories, but no one knows about them. And uh, he's really set about making that. And, and so, um, to that extent, that sort of continuing frustration, you know, and, and I'm a competitive person, um, and, uh, and I've always seen my role as really, you know, making my institution the best it can possibly be. And so there was a long period, I think, where we just, we're dithering around and so on, and and so uh, I think missed opportunities. Maybe should have done some stuff earlier, things earlier, and so on. But it takes time and for people to come around. So, uh, you know, actually, I have no regrets in that sense at all about about uh, staying at Macquarie and, and working with it. So I think we have a fantastic future, actually, and um, and so I think we. We already are. We, we, we had this compacts meeting um, a month ago, and they started off by saying, "Oh, you've you've had this vision of being in the top eight. How's that going?" And I said, "Well, we don't have that vision anymore." And they said, "Why?" I said, "Because we are in the top eight. Uh, look at these rankings. We're clearly as good as any of the GO eights. We don't want to be a GO eight, but we want to establish our own identity. But to do that and have credibility, you have to be as good as your competitors, and we are." Um, so, um, uh, lost opportunities in some, you know, I, I have auto-suppressed them. Um, there's certainly times where I, I can remember feeling um, sort of, uh, God, I wish I hadn't said that, but I can't remember what it was I said now. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you sometimes do that, and I'm sort of outspoken, I, as you know, and I, I hate sitting on committees and not saying anything. Everybody knows that. Um, <laughs> And, um, but it seems to me if you're there, say it. Uh, and sometimes that leads you up the garden path, as you, as you well know. Uh, I, I do remember one incident, um, this is when I was on the ARC, and I was uh, uh, on the um, fellowships committee, and I was paired with uh, Frank Larkins, who you know, he's a very famous scientist from, um, from Melbourne University. And, we were the physics guys, and I don't know if you know how that works, but um, there were sort of paired people for each of the different areas, and, um, one, and one of the areas was creative arts. And um, we each had to come up with our two best candidates to put on the table for a start, sort of like a sort of a bartering process, really. And, um, and uh, so you had your, your two that you absolutely were 
convinced sort of be given fellowships and he had a sequence and there was this process and um, and um, we um, we each put our two on the table but the, the creative arts lady put her uh, two on the table and one I thought was re really good but the other thought I was I was just thought this person is just nowhere near as good as the other people on the table and I started to say that and I received this and incredibly sharp kick in the ankles from Frank, um, but too late. <laughs> and so um, having said, I don't think this person is very good, and I was rather young and inexperienced, I was then sub subjected to an hour tirade about bloody scientists and <laughs> creative arts and, you know, and, and so on. And afterwards I asked, asked Frank uh, why he kicked me, he said, well, for exactly the reason that, that you said, you know, you've got to give a bit sometimes <laughs> and just let those ones go and <laughs> uh, looking at the bigger thing. So it was, it was quite a big, big lesson and I still have the scar. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of funny stories, do you remember, what would you say if somebody said, what was the funniest thing that's happened to you while you've been at the Oh, gee, funny. Um, uh, that's, that's uh, gee, that's... Um, that's uh, that stuff. Oh, I'll tell you one thing. Yeah. Um, now, you, there's a bit of science in this, but I hope you get the um, the uh, message. So, in about oh, Barry Jones was the minister of science at the time, so it must have been the Hawke government, you know, mid '80s. And there was a visit from what was then the um, Higher Education Commission or something at the time to the university. And I had a laser lamp, and all the visitors came with a laser lamp because, you know, flashing lights and steam and stuff. Uh, and, um, uh, there were, and so Barry Jones came around with all these minders and stuff, and there was a, a couple of, um, and some journalists. And um, we had just acquired this new, absolutely revolutionary piece of gear, which was called a ring die laser. Okay, R A N G D Y E L A S E R. And I've been warned by our PR people give the journalists some nice little simple explanation of this. So I've done this half pager. Anyway, uh, so the uh, minister was going around looking at this thing, and this journal came up to me and said, What's this all about? You know. So I gave him my bit of, bit of paper. He said, Oh, I haven't got time for that, just tell me about it. So I told him about it, uh, and um, the, about this ring die laser. And um, the next day there was this picture in the Australian and the Sydney Morning Herald of Barry Jones looking at this device, uh, described as Australia's latest ring dilator. <laughs> D-I-L-A-T-O-R. <laughs> Never trust journalists, right? <laughs> so you, you've talked you know, really strongly about your passion for graduate students. Tell us about Jim the teacher, because we've talked a lot about Jim the researcher. What were your thoughts of being you know, um, there teaching? Well, I, you know, I always actually enjoyed teaching. Um, uh, the, the second wing I, I, I arrived, I mean, most of us will know this as academics, you know, you, you, you know, as an undergraduate, you know, you mug up your stuff and you pass exams, but the truth is you never really understand it until you have to teach it. And um, uh, I think we've all had that, uh, that experience. And when, the, when I first came, uh, I was... Um, told that the first lecture course I was going to give was classical and statistical thermodynamics. I hated thermodynamics as a, as a student, couldn't understand it and so on, so I had to, had to teach that. Um, and, uh, you know, that's actually quite a, I mean, it's a love-hate relationship, of course, I mean, and, uh, mugging all that stuff up, but boy, do you learn it. And I think one of the great things about, about um, about teaching is that you, first of all, you've really got to understand it yourself because you can't explain it unless you understand it yourself. You can't explain it credibly 
and um, I think most of us feel, you know, the first time you give a lecture course you think it was okay, second time you think it's a lot better, third time maybe you're on top of it. But um, So I always found, you know, teaching um, really interesting. I really liked interaction with students, feeling that you were getting it across um, and those sorts of things and so I always en enjoyed teaching. Um, the, the difficulty, of course, as we all know, is you've got to sort of balance all these parts of your life. And the truth is, there's no amount of time you, that you can't put into teaching to make it better. I mean, that's the truth. Uh, but if you're also going to do, you know, research and, you know, engage in, you know, departmental stuff, um, you've got to learn to balance that time. And for me, it was always, if I felt I was sort of walking into the... There were many times, I mean, I, I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning to write lecture notes because I wanted to use the day so I could be in, in the lab. So I'd write my lecture notes very early and, and often literally the ink would be barely dry when I was giving the, giving the lecture. And, and there was a point where if you felt you were sort of skimming it, it would just become unsatisfying. And you know, that was always a measure for me if I felt that I wasn't performing uh, well, I've found that deeply unsatisfying and I really, really go. I've only ever cancelled one lecture in my life, um, uh, which was um, an advanced electromagnetism. Uh, for those who have taught about permittivity and permeability and all that stuff, it gets incredibly ca complicated. The night before my wife was submitting her thesis, and she was in biochemistry and had all these gel photographs that had been pasted in and she had all these copies and we stayed up to about three o'clock in the morning pasting these bloody pictures into her thesis and when I came to give the lecture in the morning I was completely, um, and I got so confused with this stuff, I, uh, half I said, I don't understand this anymore and just cancelled the lecture and, <laughs> and, and came back and nailed it the next, next day. But I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, I like the interaction as, you know, with, with, with uh, students like lecturing, there's a bit of a theatre about it, um, uh, where, where the way in which you deliver can, can be important. Um, so, I mean, I taught right through, um, I was dean, I still taught, even gave some courses with that, but in the end that sort of does catch up with you and you just don't have the time to do it. But. Um, uh, in the in the end, teaching is actually why we're here. Um, I'm a great advocate of, of researchers being really involved with with teaching. That makes things attractive to the students. Uh, they know they're talking to someone who 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 is intimately involved with their with their discipline. Um, so I've i really in, in, uh, enjoyed that. And it's sort of curriculum development is you know, interesting, uh, and so on. So, I mean, it was a bit of regret. I mean, in, in some respects, um, when I moved to this role, you know, I just couldn't teach anymore, and, um, and uh, one sort of missed that a little. And, and you mentioned there about attracting students. We, we hear and know a lot about the challenges of getting people into science. What's your take on that and where we need to go? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough at the moment. Um, I think actually what we are seeing is a turning of the corner a little bit with, with science. The numbers of science have just started to come back up again over the last three or four years and, the, and I think the faculty is doing a great job in promoting that. The, the fundamental issue however remains about the uh, level of preparation of students. I mean the truth is I was doing stuff at high school, you know, that we teach in second year maths now. And so the, the, the maths knowledge is going really down. And uh, in China recently, you know, the um, maths level in, in, in China is actually really high. Uh, um, and, and that's a problem for, for the Western world. It's not just Australia, the Western world. Uh, and so those issues of making sure um, that our uh, young folks get introduced to science early um, mathematical ability is actually really important um, and that's something that has to be in, invested in. But the, you know, as there's a, a, a swing back towards that, it, it's really important. I listened to people on the radio yesterday you know, talking about manufacturing and the fact that Australia has to be in high-end manufacturing. That's very sophisticated. You need a lot of those uh, 
skills, the finance industry, and so on. So we have a bit of a challenge to, to do that. But, you know, the, I think the interest is coming back. I think from Macquarie, the development of engineering is very important. Uh, we're getting a lot of traction with that. That's a, a very good career uh, job uh, for, for people with a science uh, bent. Um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, but I think a lot of, um, we've, we're actually getting really good traction on that and the numbers are increasing. It'll help us also that we're expanding medicine because medicine has a lot of connections back into, into science and so development of biomedical science and either Dean's uh, very uh, keen to pursue that is a very important element. Uh, these days you just have to look at a lot of those cross disciplinary things, start mixing them up, you know, just teaching sort of mainline chemistry, mainline physics um, uh, is, is of more limited interest, but, you know, you, you're stuck in, in this vice, really. You've got to teach the basic skills. Uh, if you, if you, so you've got to have a substance, and sometimes you have to compromise on content, because if you go too much content, you don't have the substance. It's about balancing that. Okay. What's next for Jim Pumper? Uh, well, um, can't imagine he's actually going to run away. But. Yeah. Um, well, um, sorry to make you jealous, but um, I had always um, anticipated uh, I nothing. The physics department here is great. I've been I've got an office there. Half the faculty, I'm pretty much all the faculty was involved in pointing, and half of them are former graduate students and, and old colleagues. So it's a very nice home. Um, but I couldn't think of anything worse of, of, than sort of finishing this job and turning up the next day in the lab. So I always determined that I'd, I'd go away and have a real break. So come the 28th of June, I'll be shouting my um, wonderful team, headed by Tori and uh, Aaron, uh, Ren and, um, and Louise. We're going to have a champagne breakfast. Bacon and eggs, I think, is on the agenda. On, Next Friday, and then I'm going to, um, my wife and I are going to the airport, and we're flying to the south of France, where I've um, hired a villa for a month, and um, just have a complete change of scenery. Going to be joined there by my son and his wife, and my daughter and her husband, and then we get back after a month. Uh, my daughter and her husband, who met at Oxford at Wilson College, <laughs> second generation. Um, are relocating back from Holland to here, and my daughter Alana's going to have, uh, haven't got a defil at Oxford, she's, she's going to have a, a baby ETA Christmas Day, and um, my son and uh, his wife have just also confirmed they've um, got a similar thing happening, ETA Australia Day. Um, <laughs> so. There's going to be lots of interesting things to do, and of course I've been invited to do a variety of uh, uh, things around the university and, and by other universities. Uh, and um, we're waiting on tenterhooks for, uh, for the um, ARC linkage grants to be announced, hopefully within a couple of weeks, uh, because we have a really exciting project that we could get that. And, and um, those who wonder, I've had many ARC uh, grants in my time, but there's never been a time when I know what's going to happen, you know. We used to get our letters of advice in an envelope and my hand would shake just like anyone else's because I just never knew what the outcome was going to be. It's a bit of a noisy system, but of course you've got to be there and on, on time you've got, to, you've got to do it. So uh, I've got some grants um, hopefully uh, come in, lots of graduate students I'm interacting with and so I'll continue to do that and a few things outside the university. I just won't have to deal with quite so many bushfires, I trust, uh, that, that uh, have to happen. And I'll, of course, I'll watch the university's progress towards truly the best university in Australia uh, with great interest over the, perhaps the next 20 years. May, may take 20 years, may take a bit, a bit longer, but I think Macquarie has every aspect going for it. Um, the transformation of Macquarie, and this is very much part, part of the strategy that you've been involved with and we're hearing out, 
to being a true, maybe the one true university village in Australia, you know, in the middle of a larger city, I think that's incredibly exciting. I sort of will be missing away, not being sort of directly involved, but indirectly I'll be involved. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. We do have Actually, uh, no. In fact, um, it's really, really due to her that I really gained that interest. And, and um, but uh, although she's a molecular biologist, but our, our paths have not not intersected that that much. In fact, actually, she plays a really good role because she's really down to earth about that stuff. I mean, one of the terrible things that physicists do is tend to reduce problems to things that they can solve uh, and not solve the actual problem. <laughs> and, that, and that is um, quite a sort of telling thing as you move more and more into multidisciplinary stuff and sort of cross those boundaries. Um, uh, you've got to be very careful that you're actually listening to and solving the problems that those folks want you to solve, uh, not the ones you think you can solve because you can reduce it to a simple, simple question. And, and, and I, at many times with some of my uh, colleagues too, have to remind them that that's the issue, that you've got to deal with the, with the real problem. And actually she's been uh, really um, uh, very helpful in that because she, she's just, you know, she does, you know, PCR and, 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 and you know, all of the well-known molecular biology techniques you just say, why would you do that? We can do that easily with these other techniques. Um, why would you do it your way? Just because it's, you know, it's a smart-ass physics solution to something we don't really need to be solved. What you should be addressing is something else. That's actually been very, extremely useful. On the other hand, um, if you engage with that, and it takes a long time. When we were working on this um, cryptosporidium problem, I mean, it took us ages and ages to even understand what we're talking about. And I remember once a graduate student of mine who, I mean, all right, one of the things I feel a bit bad about, there have been actually two or three students that haven't finished over the years, and I always felt bad about this. Um, but this one was a sense of triumph. So Mark Gauchy was working on, on um, aspects. In fact, we, we had a rather started off because um, Andy Beatty wanted to be able to um, characterise mites. Mites are really tiny little things that, uh, that you know, just around everywhere. And mites, uh, the mite population um, is quite a good indicator of environmental health. So if you've got a, you know, a really bad area of land and, you know, there'll be different mites. And so we're starting to do that. And we, we, uh, we're looking at an idea of um, using almost like a barcode, a sort of barcode idea of these mites, you know, because they come in all sorts of shapes. Some of them are short and fat and round. Some of them have got lots of legs and antennas and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, why don't we try and barcode them and get a sort of a signature for these bugs? And we had great flights of um, fancy. We had a hopper with these things coming down and we were going to use them, um, you know, barcode them as they fell down a chute. But then I said, why don't we put them onto a sticky disc? And then, then we can read them. So we come up with this concept which is called bug rom. Right? <laughs> um, he was working on that. But, but he, at the time, um, uh, was... Um, uh, he got engaged in this cryptosporidium thing. It was an actually great student called Graham Vesey that people will know too. Who, he was the, uh, the PhD student who was interested in this cryptosporidium problem and, and Mark working. And they really worked together in, 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 in that. They both had uh, stellar careers. Uh, Mark Gauchy actually took the crypt cryptosporidium thing. Mark and Graham Vesey took, the, took the, the tests, the protocols they developed, established a company called Biotechnology Frontiers. It was the best new start in New South Wales. Subsequently sold it to a lot of money to, to a French company and Mark is still with, with them. By the way, just as an aside, 
Mark was a young guy from, um, I think he came from Taree, and when he started, he he um, he got an apprenticeship, and he was working for BHP on their um, their methane carrying ships, and he said he was on deck, hosing down a deck in the freezing cold in Hobart. He looked over the side and he thought, there's got to be a better life than this. <laughs> so he decided to do physics and he's now done very well in, in that incredibly um, resourceful uh, uh, guy. Um, but I remember he, he, one of the things about understanding the problems is once you understand them, Physics are quite, physicists are quite good at sort of then being able to translate that into a, into a problem they can understand. And that's the problem. You have to listen, listen, listen until you understand what the problem is. And then often the solution can be like, you know, high school physics actually. Uh, and they came to me with a, with, a, with a problem to do with the way they were ratioing these signals in flow cytometry. And without even thinking, I said, oh, well, you don't want to do this, you should ratio this with this and this and this and this. And I said, oh, okay. They went off. It, I mean, it literally took five minutes. Because I really didn't understand the problem they were dealing with. And once they actually explained it to me, I could do that. And then that became an integral part of the solution. And, and I still, or actually the university still gets a few hundred dollars a year from royalties from that particular thing, because I had some fractional royalties for that. So, and, and you know, Mark, um, a roundabout way of saying um, when you do multidisciplinary things, you've really got to listen, listen to the other people and, and distill it. Rather than going and thinking, hey, have I got a solution for you? It's about what's your problem, understanding that, and then creating a solution to that. And that's why I'm actually a passionate believer in maintaining the traditions of the basic sciences. So I've, I'm a passionate believer in people being physicists and you know, molecular biologists and all these sorts of things and getting their tradition and then putting them together. I think if you try and teach multidisciplinary stuff at an early level, it actually doesn't work because no one actually gets the foundation that you need. So those traditions are actually really important and really important to maintain. Then you put people together there and as long as they listen to each other and understand, trying to get a common language and understand what the problem is, then often the solutions come tumbling out to that. And uh, in many respects, I think uh, Anita was quite an important factor in that. I mean, those that know her, um, uh, um, no one like my wife to keep people grounded. <laughs> and on that note, we have to stay grounded and let these good people get back to it what they need to do, and I know you've got a lot of meeting coming up too, so I know that you may well have other questions, and actually if you do have any burning ones, I'm sure Jim will always answer his email. <laughs> 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 and on that note, let's, let's thank you. Thank you.